Hey guys, this is Ron. So in this uh, video, uh, as a part of our uh, Rediscovering C series, it says video two, and we're gonna talk about the uh, compilation process as well as using compiler flags, uh, and then we'll finish off with make files. So during compile uh, compilation, there's a couple things that happen, and we didn't really see them when we invoked GCC on the command line in our videos uh, zero and one. So if you didn't get a chance to, to see either of those videos, I invite you to do so. It'll help to make sure that uh, we're all, uh, both in kind of the same place uh, as far as code goes uh, and our environment. But uh, in our last video, we made a hello.c. We also made a utilities header file and a utilities source file. And so we were able to compile those just running GCC on the command line. And so let's talk a little bit about what actually happened when we did that. So I linked in an article from Geeks for Geeks. So if we go there, what we'll see is they have this great article um, that kind of breaks down the uh, compilation process. And there are four steps that they kind of define here. The pre-processing, the compilation, the assembly, and the linking. So what happens in those steps? So pre-processing removes comments. And I know we haven't talked about comments in our code, but almost every language has some way for a developer to convey an idea or remind them, oh, this is why I did it this way, you know, whatever, right? Well, those comments are for the developer, not necessarily needed for the functionality of the program. So those are stripped out of the code because there's nothing really there to compile. Additionally, we see expansion of macros, uh, expansion of included files. And so we saw this a little bit in our, in our sample program from the, the first video in that uh, we had macros for our header guards, right? So we had a pound defined in there. Uh, which defines some name, uh, but it could also do more than just that. And we could use some of those names in our code. And so during the compilation process, the preprocessor goes through and replaces those uh, entries in our code with what they actually are, right? In conditional compilation, in our header file, uh, we built a header guard and we did a uh, pound if and def, so if not defined. So that was something that, you know, would change, you know, potentially how our program gets compiled. Um, if you look at other programs that are out there, especially things like the, the Linux kernel, they're going to have uh, things in there that will specify, hey, do this if you're on this type of processor, but do that if you're on a different type of processor, right? And so during the compilation process, it then compiles our code differently depending upon you know, which processor we're uh, running. And so that preprocessor takes care of doing some of that early legwork um, in, in the process. Well, then we move on to actual co uh, compiling. So in our first video, uh, zero, where we did some of our environment setup, we decompiled, or not decompiled, we disassembled our main function inside of GDB. And so we saw a little bit of assembly code. Well, during the compilation process, we're going from our C source code to assembly code. And we could specify a, a uh, uh, a flag with GCC that would, instead of building all the way to our binary, it would stop at this assembly kind of uh, code that you see in front of you, right? And so uh, it it's this process of going from source code to assembly code, and then from assembly code further into our uh, actual binary that the processor can run. And so this is like a middle step that kind of gets us there. And so then it takes that assembly co code and then the assembler takes all of these 
So like the uh, sub Q that you see there, the move L, there or push Q, there are opcodes for each of those. Basically binary digits or you know binary uh, equivalents that the processor understands. And so the assembler goes through and takes all of those commands and replaces them with their opcode, right? And so what you end up with is a binary that the, the uh, processor can actually run. And then in this last step, it does some linking. And so the linker uh, has to go in. And in our case, what we did is we did a printf which was a part of um, the standard IO uh, file. So that header file specified STD, or the STDIO header file specified there's this printf function. And so now the linker has to go out and either bring printf into our function or into our binary, if that's how we wanted to compile it as a static binary, or more than likely, in our case, we just did the regular GCC command. The compiler uh, or the linker went out and just said, okay, well, the printf function is in this shared library. And so it basically points us to that shared library and points us to where printf uh, actually lives, right? And so we've saved a little space in our executable. It doesn't have to include printf printf as long as printf is there available uh, on the system but if we wanted to compile it as a static binary it has to go out and get printf bring it into our um, binary so that we can use it right and so that's the job of the linker is to go out and find all these external things and either bring them into our binary or at least point our binary to those um, to those functions Right, so that's compilation, and the, and the reason I bring that up is because as we're going through and we're having to troubleshoot some of our issues, things like the linker sometimes glare their head, right? And so uh, there will be times where I'll use a math function um, or I'll use a a function inside the threading library that. Um, I'm going to have to specifically tell the linker where to go and get it because it's not technically uh, a part of the standard library. So I have to tell the linker, you know, where to go to get this code. Additionally, um, there are compiler flags that we may want to concern ourselves with. So we've used the GCC. Um, compiler to to do these various things for us but it gets tiring um having to type in gcc tech o um hello hello dot c uh utility dot c and utility utility dot h to compile every time so that's Kind of a pain in the butt plus there's there's some extra things we could be doing to check our program for um errors so we don't have any syntax errors necessarily in our program so it compiles just fine but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have done all the proper things and our binary is is good to go so obviously it runs but again, there could be some things in there that you know have some issues. Well, one of the things we can do is turn on some uh, warning flags to, to kind of key ourselves into whether or not that's an issue. So if we do a man on GCC, so we're looking in the manual page for GCC, we can do a slash warning, and we'll see all of these warning options, all right? So there's tons of them here. And if we go, I linked in another article um, that's gnu.org that breaks down a lot of these errors. So it has, you know, write ups on what these various errors are for, what they'll key in on, so on and so forth. And like I said, you can clearly see there are a ton of them. Now, I probably don't need every single one of them, 
but there are a couple of key ones that I, I typically like to include every time. So if I hit my up arrow, I'll go back to my GCC uh, command that I ran before, and I'll put a couple of them in there. So I typically do uh, W all, I typically do W extra, and I typically do pedantic. And so what we'll see when we compile it with these warning flags, that now we, we actually see there's, there's an underlying issue in our program. It doesn't break functionality, but it might key us into we made a mistake somewhere along the way. In our case, the only thing it's keying us in on is when we wrote hello.c in our previous uh, video, that we said the main function takes this int argc and this char star star argv, but we didn't actually use them for anything, right? And so that might be an indication that we have had some type of, of mishap in our program that we've had to um, go ahead and we've, like I said, we've missed something and maybe that's an indication that we need to go back and take a look at it, right? Uh, so these compiler flags are, are helping us to hopefully avoid shooting ourselves in the foot later on in life, right? Um, so we could fix that in, in this program and try to clean it up. In this case, I'm not gonna do that. I want you to see that if you run these commands that you see the same errors as I do. Now, again, just like before with the GCC, TACO, blah, 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 now we have even more stuff on the command line that we have to remember to type each and every time. Well, that may put us into a point where I get lazy or I'm rushing and I miss something. I don't turn on a flag I should have. I don't want to put myself in that position. So instead, there's something called a makefile. And I've linked in another article also on gnu.org that helps us to build consistent uh, compilation and cleanup. So if I come here, I'll see that there's this thing called make and make files. So if I look at my simple make file here, what I'll see is I have this file uh, called make file and in it, I'm kind of specifying what that, you know, compilation process should look like. So in this case, this is a target. These are source files for that target. And then this is the command that gets run to build that target, All right? Now, in this case, this is a very simple um, uh, make file. You can get very complex make files that do all sorts of different things. Uh, in my opinion, at the very beginning, just stick with the simple make file. Um, it's just easier. Um, but later on, you may want to do some cool wazoo whiz bang stuff and make can definitely do it. But the point here is that I have a target. I have source files that, that are required for that target. And then I have the command that I'm going to run to build. Now, notice here we have a main.o. So this is an object file. It's like an intermediary file that that got compiled, but we're not fully to our um, to our executable. But this is exactly what we want. Is so edit requires main.o. Main.o requires main.c and def.h. Edit requires kdb.o and kdb.o requires kdb.c, uh, .h and command.h. So we're able to kind of break our program up. But the beauty of this is if I go to compile edit and the only file in all of these that's changed is main.c, then all of these .o files, they don't need to get recompiled. They'll just sit there on the drive, all happy-go-lucky. Make will go back through, it'll recompile main.o because main.c changed and then it will recompile edit, right? But it doesn't have to recompile any of these other files. And that's beautiful because if you get to a really big program, you don't wanna to have to recompile every single bit of source code 
just because one file in all of those source code or source files changed, right? So just playing around, I've compiled the, the Linux kernel before and it can take hours, you know, at least well over an hour, depending upon how uh, fast your machine is to compile that code. Well, I don't wanna have to burn another hour or more just because I made one small change to one file in all of those files, right? I just wanted to compile the couple of things that rely on that file. And so make will allow us to have that consistent build. It'll save us time. Um, and so I recommend running GCC from the command line is great when you're you know, initially getting started, but if you're gonna start building an actual project, move to something like make right now there are other things besides make that you can use this happens to be what i'm used to um, and so it's what i will uh, demonstrate so we have this uh these flags that we want to make sure get added in we have our source files so let's go ahead and start to build a make file and hopefully we won't have too many issues building it but we'll see so the first thing in my make file that I'm going to do is I'm going to specify, um, they're basically like environment variables here at the top, right? So I'm going to specify a couple of things that I want to make sure make understands, right? So the first thing is I'm going to tell make I want to use the GCC compiler. And then additionally, I'm going to tell it which compile time flags I want to use. So we can do C flags equals, um, and here's where we can do, um, I think you can do plus equals as well here, but this is where we're gonna tell it, uh, I want W all, I want W extra, and I want W pedantic, right? Now I'm gonna specify a target called all. All is like a catch-all, really. It's the first target that will get run. So I can, if I just hit make, the first target it's going to find is all. Or I could do make and the name of a target and it'll run just that target. But if I just run make, it's going to hit this as its first target and I want it to build hello. And I want, uh, so that's, that's good. And so I have to have a target called hello and hello relies on hello.c and it's gonna rely on, we'll call this utility.o. And if we get lucky, we can just specify utility.o and we're gonna specify utility.h and utility.c. And notice here, I'm not actually telling it what command to run. And that's one of the beauties of uh, make as well, uh, is I gave it some uh, basic uh, input with these uh, variables here. And it's just gonna go ahead and build those for me using those variables. Now I can specify it, but again, we're gonna, we're gonna give it a try without specifying. And then I'll do a final target here called clean. And one of the things with make files is you actually want an actual tab. So if you have an editor that replaces tabs with spaces, which I fi find myself in quite a bit because if I'm writing Python code and I hit tab, I actually want it to replace this, it, the tab with spaces. But in this case, the make file actually needs a tab, not spaces. Um, and so I'm just going to do an rm.rf star.o because my hope is this utility uh, portion builds utility.o. And so I'm going to delete all of my .o files and I'm going to delete my binary hello. Okay. Now, if we've done everything right, I'm going to do a set list just so that we can see when I do a set list from Vim, it shows me a little bit of extra information. So this control I is my tab. If it had replaced it with spaces, I, would, it, I wouldn't see that. And so again, that's one way to kind of double check, at least within inside of Vim, that you have spaces, not tabs, or you have tabs, not spaces. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove hello, and let's see what happens 
when I run make. Okay, first off it tells me make's not actually installed, so let's install it. sudo app install make. Alright, so it went ahead and it is installing make. And I'll go ahead and run make. And so what we see is that it ran GCC with my compile time flags. It did a tax C on my utility file. And what I should see is this should have produced a utility.o. So that's that object file that we wanted, that intermediary kind of file. And then it included that .o when it compiled uh, hello.c. And then because my warning flags also got co copied over again, I see the same warnings I have from before. And I have my binary. And it works. So we are good to go, right? And now if I hit make again, there's nothing to do for all. All was the first target it got to. It looked at um, the all required uh, hello and it required utility.o. And so it went to those places and said, well, the source files that those things rely on have not changed. So there's no reason for me to recompile. So what would happen if I did, um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll change utility.c. And I will just merely, I could have probably just did a touch on utility.c and it would have changed the time and date stamp on it. But let me go ahead and make, and sure enough, it detected the change in utility.c. It recompiled uh, the .o file, and because the .o file is a part of hello, it went ahead and recompiled .o, or recompiled hello. All right, and again, if I hit make again, nothing to do for all. Sweet, so now we have a consistent build that I know will always have the compile time flags that I want. It has that kind of error checking that I want, um, and it's not gonna recompile things that didn't change, all right? Now the last thing is we can do, we have now made a uh, .o file, and we have our executable. So maybe before I, I know everything works, I know it compiles the way I want, it's now time for me to uh, commit you know, my changes to Git, whatever, or maybe I wanna start from fresh. I can now do make clean, and that runs that clean target, which is gonna delete all my O files and the executable hello. So, the executable has disappeared and the .o file disappeared. So when I run make again, it rebuilds them. Now, one of the things you may end up seeing is you'll see an entry called .phony. At least I think it's phony like this. Um, you'll see stuff like that. What this means is although there's a target called clean, clean doesn't actually build something called clean. So don't worry about the fact that it doesn't output anything, just run these commands, right? And so that's what you'll typically see. So you may see uh, all here as well, all in clean because they don't actually produce a binary. Whereas hello and utility.o, they, they definitely produce something. So right and quick, make clean, make, everything still works, right? And that's what we want to see, right? Is when we hit make, it runs our all, or we could have done make clean, we could do a make hello. So we're specifying a very specific target like we did with make clean, and it runs it. But in our case, because all is the first thing it gets to, and all says to go ahead and build uh, hello, it makes it nice for us because all we have to do is type make. I don't have to specify a target and we're good, right? So we've definitely made it a little bit easier on ourselves. Um, 
by building a make file that kind of automates some of that compilation process. We have a better understanding of what that compilation process entails. And we've added a little bit of different, you know, warning checks and stuff like that so that as we're compiling these things, it, it hopefully will alert us to when we've made some type of error. So hope you found this uh, helpful. Uh, I know uh, make files and understanding them a little bit um, has definitely helped me. And almost every project I've been to um, that is more than just one or two files, they build a make file. And so understanding make or some of the other um, other programs out there that you can kind of use other than make, you know, the better off you'll be. Because again, you're probably gonna work on a project. There's gonna be other developers. You wanna make sure you're compiling in the exact same way they're compiling. So if they're seeing an error and you're, you know, trying to help them troubleshoot, you guys are both doing the same thing, right? Um, so that's what you wanna see. So again, I hope you found it helpful. I know uh, I end up using this stuff all the time. All right, bye.